Ontario's budget, did it spend too much, spend too little? Is it a, a spendthrift budget? Tax and spend is how one person I saw describe it. I'm not sure they know what that means. Hi, I'm Brian Lilly, political columnist with the Toronto Sun. Joining me here to discuss the budget is Catherine Swift from the Coalition of Concerned Manufacturers. And Catherine, uh, your statement, I think, on the budget was fair overall, critical of the spending, but appreciative of some of the moves the government's making. Uh, do, so do you give it a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or kind of sitting sideways in the middle? I, I think it would probably be kind of neutral. Obviously, it could have been much, much worse. Uh, and the political climate right now is such that um, I, I still don't. I, I remember back in the 90s when we had terrible, terrible problems at the federal level in particular. And the Canadian public seemed to be very on board with cutting government. And government was cut at the federal level in particular, and a lot of that was also pawned off on the provinces. But I don't see that now. No. It, it's it's interesting how a majority of Canadians seem to think that government spending is is always a good thing. And maybe we need another another debt crisis. I hope we don't need another debt crisis, but maybe we do to, to have people realize we can't do this forever. Uh, I think the left has been successful in promoting that message. You know, we heard about so-called modern monetary theory where you could just spend like mad and there wouldn't be any inflationary consequence. Well, we saw how that worked out. I think this budget, you know, they could have spent a lot more. I think they resisted the temptation to do so. And that was absolutely the right thing to do. But when we look at our um, indicators in the economy, like jet, de uh, debt to GDP, um, GDP per person is very worrisome because it's declining quite significantly. And that means our standard of living. You know, you, you can talk about all the economics babble you want, but bottom line is our standard of living is declining. That hits all of us. So that's something all governments should be paying attention to, including Ontario. Well, the Bank of Canada deputy governor putting out that speech calling productivity an emergency and, you know, translate productivity into how the rest of us speak. It's how well we do. It's how much money we're making, what our earning power is. Um, and that's on the decline. Now, that's not something that the province of Ontario can uh, manage on its own, but there there are things that they can do. Uh, you know, Speaking with some of the people at the budget yesterday, they said, look, uh, you know, I, I may have been call, calling them liberals, telling them they're spending like a liberal, and, and they were taking the, the ribbing in good nature. But they said on the back end, on the stuff that people don't look at, they said this is still a budget that we can go and sell to New York. And, and I don't think a lot of people realize how important it is that right after budgets, every finance minister goes to New York. They're trying to raise capital. They're trying to refinance debt. That um, they felt that this was a budget that while uh, the spending's high and there's some a lot of infrastructure projects in there, I think highways was mentioned 30 odd times in Peter, Peter Bethlen Falvey's speech, they felt that the fundamentals on the back end were solid. You're someone who looks at those back end numbers. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think Bethlen Falvey actually is the really solid finance minister, to be honest with you. He's a low key guy, which is good in a finance minister, <laughs> uh, in my opinion. Uh, and and he has done some good things. He's He's got our debt financed at a relatively low level of interest rates. So we're less exposed to those kind of markets. And but we have we all have big debt. I mean, all provinces and, and the federal government in Canada has big debt right now. Uh, so the this statement would go for all of them is that we, we got to finance that debt. And like you say, they, they immediately go to financial markets to sell their particular budget. But I think you know we had the pandemic, governments grew at some levels more than others. We know the federal government grew horrendously and inexplicably. Mm -hmm. um, and in Ontario grew to nowhere near as much, but still grew. We should be cutting back now. And one thing, if you want to talk about productivity, the number one thing to boost productivity is investment, investment in technology. So people are more productive because they have more efficient, you know, more modern technology to deal with, for example. That, I think, is a key message for government. Government is always lagging in terms of its adoption of technology. Businesses adopt it because they have to. If they don't, they can't compete you know, yeah. with, in, in, a, in a free market. So they're forced to do it. Government's forced to do it. So they tend not to. But that's something, if I had to prioritize something to boost productivity in Ontario, I'd say use technology to shrink government. We know they can do it. Uh, it, it, with attrition and things like that. Uh, government is so large already. It's not like you have to wholesale fire a whole bunch of people, but there's a lot of streamlining that should be done. So I think that would be number one consideration for me. Uh, and that's a long, that's a medium term kind of objective. I, 
On the issue of cuts, I want, I want to get to how government can help businesses, especially manufacturers, big part of our economy in a moment. But on the spending still, um, I think education spending is going up by about 2.7%. That's just below what they said was the uh, CPI for the year. The uh, health spending going up even less, like less than half a, or about half a percentage point. But since Ford came to, to office, uh, health spending is up 39%. And education spending is up 30%. Inflation over that time is 19%. So they've obviously been spending. Um, and, it, it, and the public sector unions representing the nurses, the hospital workers, the teachers, they say, well, it's still not enough, you're cutting. The liberals and the NDP say, still not enough, you're cutting. What's an acceptable level of, of spending in these two key areas where, you know, I, I get your point about government should, uh, you know, adopt technology. Those are two areas where it's hard to adopt technology and, and replace a teacher, replace a nurse, replace a doctor. Uh, but what is an acceptable level of spending in those areas? Uh, well, I, I think you have to look again over a sort of medium to long term standpoint, because um, it tends to be lumpy spending. You, you know, you buy new MRIs or something, a big lumpy uh, spend for a hospital, say, uh, in the education system. We've seen class sizes shrink and shrink and shrink. They'll never be small enough for the unions. I think they wouldn't be happy unless they had two teachers to one student. Then maybe they'd say, well, you know, that that boosts our union dues. So we're very pleased with that. But I, I like to look at international comparisons and comparisons with other jurisdictions within Canada. We already spend lots per capita in both of those areas. And the left will always cry for more spending. I, I guess they don't care if we go into default as a, as a province. But um, we don't really need to be spending much more at the moment than inflation plus population increase. That's kind of a, a guideline. Um, and uh, the other it, problem is more than $17,000 per student in the education system right now which I think would yeah. shock most people. I, I, I It should. Uh, and also, though, we look, look over the McGinty and Wynn years, education spending doubled. And most of that money went to teachers, wages, benefits, and, and so on. Their pensions are ha, have had a little bit of a rough ride lately, like all of our investments have. So suddenly, taxpayers are probably going to be asked to cough up a bit more money for those very nice gold-plated pensions that teachers have with early retirement. But yes, we're already spending lots. We could economize in a number of areas. Uh, and and the, 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 the left, I think you just have to ignore it. Of course, they're always going to want more money because this is money that goes right into their pockets. So who, who doesn't like that kind of scenario? But looking internationally, healthcare and education both, we have we, we see our students slipping in terms of doing you know performance measurement on on testing and so on in the healthcare system. We know we're in a fiasco right now, and other systems around the world, not the U.S. People love to bring up the U.S., but I like to look at other universal systems so they're more comparable to Canada, Europe, New Zealand, Australia. You know, there's quite a few mm -hmm. uh, systems you can look at that spend less per person than we do and yet get much better results. Don't have the waiting list we have. Why can we not look at what they're doing and take some lessons out of that for Canada. And this isn't just Ontario. This is the whole country that that applies to. The uh, Ford government has uh, loved touting over the last several years that they're bringing manufacturing back to a degree. That's true. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't think as much as you might think, but were there steps they could take in the budget yesterday or could take in the coming months or year that would aid and assist your members at the coalition in keeping um, jobs here, in, in expanding jobs here, because manufacturing is not going away. It, not everyone's going to learn to code. It's not all about the service economy. You've got to have a healthy mix. So what could they be doing to uh, improve things? Is it just a better competitive tax system? Is it write downs for equipment uh, being made quicker? What? Well, there's obviously a number of things one could do. Energy prices are still a huge problem for the manufacturing sector and businesses in general. Manufacturers in particular tend to be big users of electricity. We have un we have a very uncompetitive system, the, the old Green Energy Act. I, I realize that the Ford government has their hands tied to a certain extent because of the rather disastrous uh, energy policy of the previous liberals. So that's part of it. But for example, um, there, there's a very complex system in place for say a medium sized manufacturer. If they wanna save on their energy prices, um, they can take advantage of some savings, but they'd have to work, they'd have to have three shifts. They'd have to work, have their people work 24 hours a day. That might be feasible for a big company with thousands of employees. It's 
feasible for a 50 a 50 person manufacturing facility for example there should be more predictable and less complicated ways that a a, a small medium sized manufacturer can reduce their energy costs and right now we know of course they're spending even more to subsidize energy in this budget it went up to 7 billion dollars a year that's a lot of money mm -hmm. we're subsidizing energy uh, instead of actually fixing the fundamental problem energy is one big deal yes taxation one thing i've i've brought up to this government a number of times is the top two income tax brackets in Ontario are not indexed to inflation. The first that the second highest is $150,000 a year. It's exactly Warren Buffett territory. You know, a lot of professionals, entrepreneurs, that that is a, a feasible level of income tax for a lot. Of, a lot of people in government earn 150 grand a year for that matter. And you're not indexed to inflation. That's that's theft. That's a, just because inflation is going up. You're paying more in, in taxes when your real income isn't going up at all. So that's something they should do to those top two brackets, because the entrepreneurial sector that matters to them. And when they want to bring in somebody like an engineer or whatever, that will be earning that that type of money. Um, that's a that's a considerable uh, factor, especially compared to the U.S., where their personal taxes are way lower than ours. Uh, Catherine, if, if, if I can give you a quick anecdote on that. Um, you know, we've all heard about how people are fleeing California in the United States because taxes are so high and income tax is a big part of that. But when you're in that tax bracket, you know what? You would keep more of your money in California than Ontario. And by comparison, exactly. Ontario is better than several other provinces. So, you know, we're not going to be competitive in attracting that, that engineer who has the choice to go to a high tax jurisdiction in the US uh, versus, uh, and keep more of their money rather than come to Ontario. Yeah, and including things like healthcare workers. I mean, you know, that that's uh, high-end healthcare workers, doctors, obviously, and other other specialists. That's going to matter to them, too. So, yeah, I really think we have to get our income. And again, it's not a unique Ontario problem, but uh, Ontario does have this quirk of having these two brackets not indexed to inflation. And we've seen bad inflation lately. Um, other things that could be done, the, the old red tape, you know, the old red tape canard, I guess you could say, is is still a factor everywhere. And this but this is where if you downsize and streamline government, you'll get rid of tape so kind of by default. So that's something that has to be looked at as well. So, I, I mean, I think they're doing some things right in Ontario. They're definitely really trying hard to have a pro-business, you know, we're open for business, that, that slogan and so on. But there's a number of areas they, they definitely could be more proactive in looking at and, and really making it more affordable. I know just from my situation with the coalition, our board of directors uh, about five, six years ago, um, none of them had a U.S. facility. Now about half of them do. And that's in a fairly short period of time. And they keep regaling me with the stories of how governments in the U.S., for example, really welcome business. They, they, you often think that, that bureaucrats, this is another issue, it's culture. Bureaucrats in Canada, and again, not unique to Ontario. We see it federally and in other provinces too. They always think their job is to harass businesses, you know, <laughs> torment them, and ask for all these permits to be filled out, and so on. And and instead of having the attitude, "Wow, this person's bringing jobs. They're bringing in income tax revenue. They're bringing corporate tax revenue to to our, my jurisdiction. I should be welcoming them, treating them well." So this this that that's a tough one too. You're not going to flip a switch and change that overnight. But uh, I think it's it's still an important thing to be focused on is to change that attitude. Our entrepreneurs are super valuable to us. I think I think your average Canadian knows that. I don't know that your average government worker does. All right, Catherine Swift, Coalition of Concerned Manufacturers. Thanks so much for the time and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Brian. Let us know what you think. Drop a comment down below. Share this on social media. Tell us what your thoughts on the budget are. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.